don't already, if I've not already met you. And uh, really glad that you guys are participating in Hacks and Hackers. Some, oh, okay. And uh, just want to let you know about some announcements. And we've got a great program tonight. What? All XAB club people here, so. Yes. <laughs> We're in good hands. Um, a couple announcements. We've got a great program tonight. We're going to have another meeting on February 17th. This time it will be at the Statesman again. And our plan is pretty much to alternate between Texas Tribune and the Statesman for our meetings. Um, the meeting at the Statesman in February is going to be Andrew DuPont. He is a Gowalla employee, but he has a side project where he, um, it's a site called Filibusted. It's a really interesting site that really like looks at the U.S. Senate and the filibusters and kind of lets people know what their senators are doing to block certain types of legislation. And then um, March, South by Southwest, yay, there's lots of things going on for South by Southwest. We're going to be joining up with the main Hacks and Hackers organization for a social meetup party. There'll be more details about that. That's going to be on March 13th. So stay tuned for lots of cool stuff. Um, other things that are going on, there's some other South by Southwest activities. I know John Lukowski has some announcements to make about the journalism track at South by. You want to give us a, some details about that? Yeah, I turned out to have a bunch of announcements <laughs> tonight. Um, so uh, we convinced South by Southwest to have a journalism track when they started uh, their panel picker. I'm sure you all know the panel picker, picker really well. Um, they stopped doing organized tracks as much, but now they've kind of come back around to that. We heard they were doing another one, so we had, we have been thinking about doing some kind of conference on the future of journalism here in Austin. Uh, and we thought, well, we'll just call them and see. And sure enough, they said, it's fine, let's have a track. So the track is being sponsored by the Knight Foundation. I'm, I'm not sure that it extends for the full duration of the conference. Uh, and I haven't really looked to see how many sessions are on it. Have you? On the journalism uh -huh. track? Specific? Yeah, I, don't know specifically. I can say that I'm moderating a session on news apps that uh, includes Captain Jarmol, Aaron Philhofer. Uh, Chris Tomlinson and the infamous Niran Babalola, and uh, we're really looking forward to that particular session, but there's several other really great sessions that are happening there and a few core conversations and so forth. And then I wanted to plug also here at South by Southwest, we have Utopia 2011 at the Mexican American Cultural Center on March 14th, which is a Monday. And uh, this is something that we do every year. I've, I've got some kind of like card shaped flyers up here if you want to see more about that. It's uh, a, a, an arts and music event, and uh, the theme this year is the future of play. And then, oh, and I was going to mention this weekend, tomorrow and Saturday, we have a government 2.0 conference that focuses on transparency. We're going to talk about that, and that is something that I think. Those of us who are here in the Hacks Hackers group think about a lot. So uh, come to the conference. If you come tomorrow, we're going to charge you 10 bucks because you're going to have to eat lunch, right? But we're not serving lunch on Saturday. So if you show up on Saturday, uh, you wouldn't have to pay anything. And Saturday is actually the unconference. So you could actually come Saturday and do a session. We originally were going to do a hackathon at uh, at the conference, that was actually something Gary, the late Gary Chapman, wanted to do, and uh, we just did. We couldn't pull it together. We didn't have enough time and resources to do it. So we're not actually doing a hackathon, but it would be great to have some sessions there about uh, the kinds of things that we talk about: data transparency and how to pull data together and get meaning from it. So I think that's everything. Was there anything else I was supposed to? Do? That's all. Okay. Right. Where is the two point yeah. conference? Where is that? Oh, I'm sorry. That is at the Austin Community College's Eastview campus, which is on Weberville. Give them the website. TXGOV20. TXGOV20.org. TextGov.org uh, is the URL, and uh, all of the information is there. Okay, thank you. How many of you guys are going to be on South by Southwest? Okay, good. I look forward to seeing you there. I have a panel with someone from Gowalla on location-based services for music, so maybe some of you will come to that. Um, does anyone else have any announcements they want to make? No? Nothing? Nothing going on? Um, 
I just wanted to say, first of all, thanking the Texas Tribune for hosting us tonight and for providing the delicious home slice pizza. It's yeah. Thank you very much. I always love to use this space here, so thanks a lot for putting that together. Um, and then also want to thank all of you guys for having our first uh, few months be such a success. I don't know if you've had a chance to visit the hackshackers.com website. That's what we have up here right now. I always post pictures, sometimes video of the event. Sometimes it's just excerpts, sometimes it's the entire video, which I think I'm gonna do tonight. Um, yeah, if you scroll down a little bit, you see some pictures from the last time. Um, so we've had a lot of success, and I think if you go through the um, Austin tag on there, we've been represented quite well with the Hacks and Hackers main group. So uh, they've been in contact with us and have indicated they're really pleased with the work that we're doing here. So. Um, so there's nothing else to announce. Uh, I don't think I have anything else to announce. Um, I would like to introduce the person that's going to be speaking tonight. This is John Loyans, and he's the director of Bizarre Voice Labs. And he's going to talk with us about Django, and I'm really excited about this because I've worked with Ruby on Rails a little bit, um, and even less in Django. So I'm pretty excited about seeing maybe what some of the differences are and what actually can be done. I know that Django has some journalism roots, so I think it's like a perfect combination for this group that we have here. Um, so <coughs> John, would you take it away? Thanks very much. All right, great. Hey, uh, thank you very much, Cindy, for having me. Um, and thank you guys. I recognize a fair number of you guys. Um, so uh, this really is an intro to Django presentation. It's a presentation that I've given uh, a fair number of times at this point. Um, uh, hopefully, Cindy will have me back. I've got another presentation brewing uh, around Facebook and uh, information mining in Facebook that I think would be very interesting too. Um, but um, at Bizarre Voice, we are a uh, we're a, a business to business word of mouth marketing company, uh, and what we do is we sell a software as a service platform uh, to enable a lot of the retailers that you probably buy stuff from on a pretty regular basis. Um, uh, you know, companies including uh, Best Buy, Sephora, Macy's, uh, to include user-generated content in their sites. Um, I started at Bizarre Voice about two years ago and was able to start a group there called Bizarre Voice Labs, which very similarly to a, uh, a Google Labs or Yahoo Labs really focuses on new product uh, features and innovation for Bizarre Voice. Um, I'm really lucky to be able to work in that group because it, it really gives me a great opportunity to keep on the forefront of uh, different ways people interact with uh, social and user-generated content um, in a commerce-type environment. Um, it, it's great to have access to so many big companies that we're able to run tests with and to do a lot of innovative work with, and um, and that's really the the purpose of my group is to run tests, to test the user engagement, to figure out you know what new forms of interaction that people want to engage with, whether it's in Facebook, whether it's on a retail site, whether there's something in between, um, and because of that, my group needs to go fast. Um, our traditional software stack at Bizarre Voice is. Uh, a Java enterprise software stack that sometimes can uh, be a little heavyweight in terms of being able to turn out uh, new features quickly and to run iterative tests and to launch on a uh, weekly or even daily basis like we do in my group. Our normal release cycle is every eight weeks, which is really, really fast, but when we're talking about the world of internet marketing, um, sometimes it's just not fast enough. Um, especially when we're dealing with a new concept that, hey, you might launch and may not be good, but there may be some obvious tweaks that we want to get in there. So in my group, we use a lot of uh, rapid application development frameworks. Um, and, and one of my personal favorite rapid application development frameworks that I actually discovered a few years ago uh, when I was running a digital, uh, digital agency here in town, the technology side of a digital agency, um, is Django. Um, so, Really uh, want to give you guys a, a good intro to Django. What it is, is history, uh, some of its key features. Um, what does a, a, re a request lifecycle look like? And it's, its core uh, kind of interaction model at a, at a code level. And maybe uh, also for some of you know, non-coders in a room, maybe that will shed some light a little bit on how a typical web request is handled. You know, what happens 
uh, when you type www uh, google.com in a browser and you get a page back, right? Or yahoo.com. Um, one of the things that I really like about Django is that life cycle uh, from web browser to web server to application <coughs> container um, is really obvious and clear. And, and to me, as an engineer, I like things being very explicit. And that's something Django is very good at. Um, I'm going to live code a very simple application here. Um, so uh, I know there's a lot of folks who are actually really familiar with Django in the room. Um, so feel free to heckle me while I'm doing that. And if you see me messing up, uh, please, please stop me uh, uh, and uh, you know tell me what my my, my mess up is. Yeah, are you taking questions during your talk? Oh yeah, absolutely. Stop me whenever too. <laughs> so my question is, you you clearly chose Python over Python and Django over uh, Java because of Time to innovation yep. metrics. Okay. Yep. Um, did we you also use Ruby and a lot of JavaScript too in my group. Um, okay. Yeah. So, so what's what do you see as the difference between the job? I mean, the Python and the Ruby choice, and of course, there's also PHP and all that. Stuff. Yeah. So. Um, for us, it's not necessarily Java that uh, that causes productivity loss or an inability to deploy quickly. Um, there are some really great rapid application development frameworks that are built on top of Java at this point, too, right? Um, it's more the fact that um, our entire stack, because of the scale of Bizarre Voice, because we have over a thousand clients now and some of those really big retailers, um, for some of those big retailers, we are now 80 to 90 percent of the content on those retail websites, which is pretty incredible to think about, right? Like if you go to if you go to um, a, a a Macy's or a Best Buy or somebody like that, and I think about eighty percent of the content on those sites on big retailers, here, you're traditionally used to them controlling the marketing message and controlling all the content you get about the TV that you're looking at or the new microwave that you're looking at. Instead of that, eighty percent of the content on those sites is generated by consumers. Um, and it really changes the, the conversation. Flip side of that is, because we host 80% of that content and a very, very large chunk of any product page, you know, we can't go down, right? We can't have big rendering mistakes in the page that make like the reviews look ugly, right? Because if that happens, you're left with a big stinking hole in the middle of your, your page. And if we're looking at a, at, a, at, a, at a product display page, PDP, you know, when you see a big broken section of the site, are you going to trust that site to actually like take your credit card and complete a transaction? So because of that, our engineering group and, and the, the stack that we built is really built for maintainability um, and scalability and repeatability, right? Be able to deploy over a thousand customers and every single feature has to be able to be customized for any one of those thousand customers. And because of that, doing anything in the stack, <coughs> incurs a pretty high organizational cost. Um, so what we decided to do is extract ourselves from that uh, completely. And once we extract ourselves, it actually opened up technology choices. Um, for me, I personally really enjoy Python. So Django is a, is a big choice for me. There's a couple of other engineers on my team that prefer using Ruby on Rails. Um, almost none of us do Java <laughs> at this point. Um, because we're like, well, if we're going to completely go off reservation, let's go off reservation. Uh, Thank you. Yeah. Um, and so the last thing I wanted to get into is just some of my favorite tools that I use when I am coding uh, Django projects, either on, on my own or for work. Um, I have a few side projects, too. And when I do side projects, I use primarily Django stuff, too, although I'm starting to get a little bit more into a lot of the server-side JavaScript stuff that's out there as well, um, which, is, which is pretty cool. But we're talking about side projects and toys and tinkering in the garage uh, more than uh, deploying anything professionally. So first, let's discover what, what Django is. I mean, most of you, how, how many of you guys are familiar with the concept of like a web application framework in general? Right, so most of you. Um, so Django, quite simply, is a Python-based uh, web framework uh, named for this dude. <laughs> Uh, who's Django Reinhardt, uh, the, the famous gypsy jazz guitarist. And 
Uh, probably most interestingly for this group, created by these two guys, these two guys were working in Lawrence, Kansas on uh, the Lawrence Journal, LawrenceWorldJournal.com, which is loosely equivalent to the Austin Chronicle, but in Lawrence, Kansas. The Journal World. Journal World, sorry. I just moved here from Lawrence. <laughs> Um, and uh, the, 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 the Lawrence Journal World was originally a PHP based site um, and as these guys hacked away on it they became frustrated with the overall maintainability of PHP and decided to rewrite the site in uh, Python. When they rewrote the site in Python they realized that a lot of the structures that they were creating would be really suitable for other people to create web applications out of, and thus the birth of, of Django. Um, they built it <clears throat> as the, the web application framework for perfectionists with deadlines. That's like right on the front page of djangoproject.com. And it's something that I kind of wholeheartedly agree with. And the reason why I think it's good <laughs> for people who are, who are perfectionists is um, I come from a pretty traditional math and engineering background and for me when I started playing with Ruby on Rails five-ish years ago or so when Rails first started hitting the big time I personally found uh, Rails to cause a little bit of cognitive dissonance for me and my engineering background I found it to be a little too magic <laughs> um, things happened and websites were produced and I wasn't quite sure how and I don't <laughs> like knowing, not knowing how something happened. Um, I was like, all of a sudden there's data in my templates. How did that data get there? How, uh, it, and it was confusing. And, you know, obviously you learn and you figure that stuff out, but for me, um, the, uh, the attitude in the Python community that things should be explicit, that there should be one clear way of doing things, um, that everything should be very readable and, and you should know what's going on, uh, was very compelling to me as an engineer, but at the same time I found that I was getting the same sorts of productivity gains out of using Django. So for me it was kind of getting the best of both worlds, which was really, really compelling. Um, yeah, uh, it, it, was, it was nice and so I, I stuck with it. Um, also at the time, uh, working at the agency I worked at, we dealt with a lot of uh, kind of structured display of, of data, of kind of interesting displays of structured data. And I think that's something that Django is very good at. Um, coming out of the news world, um, it's ORM, the object relational model, how you connect to a database with Django, I think is very well suited for uh, dealing with structured data, to connecting to existing data sources. Uh, to sucking that data out and getting it into a template where you can do interesting things with it. Um, a, a lot of people will say that the, you know, when trying to pick bes between Rails and Django, the kind of canonical examples are, if you want to build a to-do list, use Rails. If you want to build a blog, use Django. Um, and, you know, that, I, I, I think that analogy holds true to this day, even though both frameworks have obviously progressed beyond that. Um, you know, it's, 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 it's st there's still a nugget of truth in that statement. Um, and I, I didn't invent that. I wish I, I could tell you who said that or where I read that, but it's, it's, it's pretty true. Um, lots of famous sites out there are built on, on Django. Obviously, uh, the onion is, uh, everybody's favorite, um, uh, Discuss, actually, we have Brett from Discuss over here, uh, which is probably the world's uh, most heavily trafficked uh, Django application, uh, responsible for commenting on uh, many, many media sites. Uh, most of the blogs you probably read on a daily basis use Discuss. Um, and finally, the building that we're in. Um, I had to stick that one in there for a <laughs> Um, uh, there's some really great uh, features in Django uh, that uh, one of the, the core philosophies of Django is that as a framework uh, there should be a suite of pluggable applications that you can use that are actually blessed by the core contributors that solve the majority of the problems and tasks that you want to solve. So 
we have things like our object relational mapping. We have an auto-generated admin UI, uh, which is really, really great. Um, generally, in Django, they eschew the idea that we should provide scaffolding, but instead give you an admin UI that will be permanently usable. So your consumer-facing site, they don't really help you much write the HTML, write the initial code for that. But what they do give you is a completely usable backend that you can uh, continue to use uh, in an ongoing way. Um, the Django template language is, uh, in my mind, uh, just the one of the best in class examples of how to do a template language the right way. Um, it's good form ha handling. It comes with built-in caching sessions, uh, user access control logic. Um, so you have all these great tools built in. Now, one of the great things about having those tools built in, though, and part of the philosophy of Django is that it's very Pythonic. Uh, again, I talked about the fact that there's no real magic in Django. It's very explicit. It's very easy to follow the control logic and what's going on in a web app. Um, and it is also very modular. And part of the advantage of that is if you don't like any of those batteries, it's pretty easy to tear them out and replace them with a, uh, with a, with a Python package of your own choosing. So don't like the Django template language? Use Jinja. Don't like the ORM? Use SQL Alchemy. You want to use uh, some sort of NoSQL backend? Um, there are great MongoDB Python connectors. Um, I believe there's even a, a Mongo, uh, like Django ORM uh, project that, that, that basically tries to mimic the Django ORM on top of Mongo, which is pretty cool. Um, I wish I knew the name of that off the top of my head, but I'm kind of blanking on it right now. Um, let's see here. And, and I think I've, I've pretty much uh, covered everything uh, that I like about uh, Django and, and its key features. Um, so uh, one of the more interesting things um, about Django is they use the terminology model view template, which I think in web applications almost works a little bit better than the traditional model view controller. Um, it's very obvious sort of what it's doing. And, and I've kind of drawn a little flow chart here of um, how things work. And it, granted, it's simplified. Um, but basically, what happens is, um, let's imagine that you type a web address into uh, uh, into a web browser. That's going to hit, that's going to resolve the domain name, going to hit a server. That server, usually fronted by Apache or Lighty or Nginx or whatever you're using to front uh, your actual like serving, um, will then go through ModWSGI, which is a Python application container, um, and proxy that request off to the Django request handler. The general request handler then takes that ModWSGI request and turns it into a very concise Python request object. Um, it takes that request object and the raw URL and sends it to the Django URL dispatcher. This is one of the nicest parts of Django, in my opinion, um, where what it does is it uses regular expressions to basically parse the URL and decide what Python function, which is again very good, um, so to call. And that's what we call the, the Django views. Now, the great thing about Django views is, again, there's no magic there. They're just Python functions. And we're just calling a function. It's passing a request object to it. Um, it accepts a set of parameters and a request object and can do lots of different things. And that's where we get this branch here. It can call the RM or it could call SQL. Um, it'll call other Django modules. Basically, all of your business logic ends up in what we call the Django view function, which um, would generally be called a, a controller in an MVC type framework. Um, finally, we get down to template rendering, which produces HTML, which we then spit out in a response object, which then goes all the way back up that chain, uh, hits the, the, the web server. The web server says, oh, now I've got a chunk of HTML. I've got a header. Off you go to the back to the client to be rendered. Um, and I think this will become a lot more obvious what we're doing when we actually like code up an application here. Um, I did mention that Django itself is very, very structured um, and definitely takes advantage of uh, Python's modular nature. 
a Django project um, is best thought of as your website. So the idea of a project actually encompasses like everything to do with your website. Um, it has a settings module, which is just straight up Python. Mm -hmm. It's got your root URL mapping, so it's got those regular expressions that tell you where to map out, uh, where, where to map your, your URL calls to, to what view functions to go to. Um, sometimes it contains templates, sometimes it contains static resources, depending on how you like to structure your projects. Um, and then finally, you've got underneath a project, you've got a series of applications. Applications are just uh, Python packages as well, and they're just units of functionality. And each application will contain a number of database models, uh, a number of view functions, um, and can contain utility classes and functions, admin classes, et cetera, et cetera. Also can sometimes contain templates, <coughs> other URL mappings, admin configuration, uh, et cetera. So, um, all of this is going to become a lot more clear when we write an application. So, uh, since I work at Bizarre Voice and since what we do is create reviews, I'm going to write a very, very simple reviews app and you can see um, kind of how simple it is. So the first thing that we got to do is start our application. Um, when you install... Oh, oh, look at that. All right, here we go. Um, so the blue will probably be a little bit hard to read, but I think the majority of it will just be in green um, and should be pretty good for you guys. Um, the so first is blue the magic that you don't want us to know? No, the blue is just my directory, so. <laughs> Could you up the size just a little bit? Uh, yep. You could go white on black. And there's a, there's a font setting that's up right now inside your article. Yeah, let's do that too, why don't we? Start black on white. Basic. It's basic. Get that That a little bit better? Yes. Thank All you. right. Those old eye people like it. <laughs> All right. So uh, when you install the Django framework, the first thing is it, it does is it installs um, some nifty helper uh, programs like Django Admin. Uh, we're just going to start a project called AHH for Austin awesome Hacks and Hackers. You'll notice inside this project, um, we have manage.py, which is a simple utility uh, to help us control our project, settings.py, and urls.py. Um, this, uh, this is pretty good for us. Here. Um, and what we're going to do now is run manage.py. Funny, it doesn't show the app switcher on the screen when I'm in presentation <laughs> mode. Um, so I'm going to run this. Well, Chrome. And yay, we have a Django project up and running. Uh, we actually served a web page. It's got nothing there, um, but it does have a couple of tips for what we might want to start off by doing. Um, so the first thing, first couple of things I'm going to do here, I'm going to just kill this server and run text main. So the first thing it suggested that we do is add a database. I've already set up a database for us um, called Austin Hacks and Hackers and using the ever so secure root on my little <laughs> machine. Um, we'll go through that. Um, now the next thing that we're going to want to do is create an application. And applications should really uh, denote uh, kind of 
pretty cohesive units of functionality. So we're going to create an application called uh, Reviews with the startup command with the startup command in this app. <coughs> You'll notice that what we've now done is uh, we've now got a reviews directory here. So I'm going to swap back over to TextMate. And it pre-populates that folder, which is really just a Python package. You notice I've got init.py here, which denotes a package a directory as being a Python package. I just created a couple of simple, uh, couple of simple files here for me. First thing it's going to create are my models. Now, when uh, Jacob Kaplan Moss and Adrian Holavati created Django, they wanted it to be able to work very easily. They wanted to work very easily with the reporters that they were working with uh, in terms of uh, being able to work collaboratively with them, to be able to give them a suite of tools that they could go and say, okay, I want to make like a polls app or I want to pull this data in to add a special feature on an article I'm writing. So let's sit down together and we'll brainstorm like what are the sorts of data you're going to want to pull in and we'll write some models to do that, right? So let's imagine we're writing our ratings and reviews app. I've got some uh, some text media shortcuts that'll prevent me from making some typos, some embarrassing typos, but uh, we'll go from there. So, since this is a ratings and reviews app, obviously we're going to want to have the concept of a review, right? Um, all right. So, just to kind of mimic the use case, like what other what things do we want to store with a review? Anybody? Text. Thank you, Garrett. So, obviously, a review needs a body, right? It needs some body text. So, um, so we have the idea of a text field. So we'll call this body, right? Uh, anybody else? What else do we want? User, username, password. Okay. Username, please. Cool. Um, now, as a developer, I might say, well, I want a user, but I want to be able to track different things. And that person might actually create more than one review. So let's uh, create a, a, a different model called reviewer. And this person might have a, uh, I guess an, probably a, a, an actual username. Um, or let's actually call it, let's, let, let, let's just call this uh, like nickname. And this person might also have a real name. So first name. And a last name. Uh, now we have to figure out how to associate a review with a with the reviewer itself. So we have the idea of a foreign key field. So if you're used to, to using databases, we can define foreign keys here as well. So we'll call this one uh, author. And the related model is going to be a reviewer. So now whenever we create a review, it's going to require that there's an author there as well. And we can either select from the existing author set, or we could create a new one and assign it there. Uh, any other ideas for stuff that we should cram in a review? How about a rating? Awesome. So let's make that uh, integer uh, field, and we'll call that rating. Uh, we may not like what everybody says about us, um, <laughs> so we'll include a Boolean publish <laughs> field. <laughs> um, Comments on the review. Yeah, sure. Why the Why the heck not? There's an infinite number of them, so that's another. <coughs> Yeah, so model comment. So, and a comment is going to have a body and most likely an author. So, uh, let your, uh, oh, related, related model. model, thank you, Garrett. Yeah, 
is correct. So let's get another foreign key. So if I'm declaring a straight, uh, you can declare many to many um, and one to many relationships. So a straight foreign key field is a one to many relationship. So uh, this is basically a, a, a one to many type relationship, right? And we get into the IDs in that model, so it makes sense. Yep, exactly. So a diff there's a different label, so you use a different command of some kind to say hey. Yep. So I assume you have a, do you have many comments somehow? Well, so the good thing here is that I don't necessarily need to define review has many. I have to basically define where ownership lies, right? So I've said that a comment is going to point at an individual review. And what Django will do as part of the model classes is follow, like it, it has reverse follow relationships. So I can, I'll, I'll demonstrate that in a little bit as well. So what I'll be able to do is write code that says review dot comment set, and it will go and get all the comments off the review. So I don't have to define the relationship by direction. I only have to define it uh, with who is actually going to own the field in the database table. Okay. Uh, any other questions here? I mean, I think it's pretty obvious how easy data modeling can be with with Django. Um, now, is for folks who are familiar with Ruby on Rails, this is definitely different um, from the standpoint that we are explicitly defining our models. Um, it's not inspecting tables in a database. Instead, we are sitting here collaboratively describing what our data looks like. Um, you can argue advantages uh, either way with this, but I, I definitely prefer the explicit uh, method of data modeling because I think it forms a contract around what you actually want to have in your database. So now I know as an engineer that if I go and I change my database in a way that invalidates my models, my software is going to complain. Where there are definitely situations, especially when dealing in multi-database scenarios, where the Rails method of inspecting the database can uh, actually almost silently fail your software. <laughs> So um, now I've got some models. So what's my uh, what's my next move? Well, my next move is I've I've got to tell my Django project about uh, the fact that I've got an application. So I'm going to go back into settings here um, and add the reviews application into installed apps. While I do that, I'm actually going to uncomment uh, the inclusion of admin as well. So what you see here is basically us telling Django, and it, it basically makes some assumptions about some common apps that you want to use, uh, including you know auth, content type, sessions, uh, messages, things like this, some very common use cases for websites. You can delete these as necessary. It just happens to be what Django defaults to. Um, for the most part, if you're just hacking away in something, they're relatively harmless to leave in, so we're going to do that right now. Um, and the next thing that we're going to do is go back to the command line and run the command sync db. Ooh, it did not like that. Oh, I didn't tell it what kind of database I want to use. <coughs> Let's run that again. And you'll notice here, what it's doing is going through here and, and talking to my database and automatically creating all the tables and all the fields and everything that I need. Um, it's also asking if I wanted to find a super user in my auth system, which I definitely want to do. I'm going to use the ever so secure admin, admin at a.com and admin as my password. So now, um, I've got a database with tables in it. Um, so in the span of about 15 minutes, we had a group discussion about what kind of data our application should have. 
um, and we've created database tables. Now it's time we actually do something with the thing. So um, normally uh, in this part of the presentation, I actually go uh, straight to the command line with this um, and manipulate the data off the command line, but I think I'm gonna skip ahead a little bit um, and go ahead and activate the Django admin. Now I mentioned earlier that uh, Django Admin has some very cool uh, automated admin tools. So to be able to activate the admin, we need to tell the admin about the models that we, we want to administer in it. So I'm just going to create a new file in here. I'm going to call it admin.py. this, place it there, and so the first thing that we want to be able to add in is a review, uh, and display, let's, uh, this will basically define what, uh, what fields that we want to display in tables showing them. Uh, we'll put mm, do no. Let's just put. Uh, we'll just go straight up and put body in there, which we probably wouldn't want to do. <laughs> and we definitely want to do a uh, reviewer. start up the development server again. I've got basically a full CMS ready to go for people to start pounding in uh, reviews. That was the built-in. This is the built-in right. admin tool. Right on. Yep. Um, so <laughs> I thought this was a Twitter tool. <laughs> <laughs> Do you notice even things like it's it's giving me a nice little uh, uh, one T or two? Garrett. Oh, Garrett walked away. He really was <laughs> bored. <laughs> One to your two, you hear it? CG. Did I spell your last name right? Uh, first name? Yes. What am I reviewing? My presentation. So it's going slow. You think yeah. it's kind of bored, yeah, as evidenced by the fact that you weren't sitting there when I called you out. <laughs> <laughs> They're gonna give me a two. No. <laughs> did that open a new window, or how did it? Yeah, it I, it did. It popped up a new window. Unfortunately, because the resolution is a little bit low, so um, uh, actually, yeah, it's just gonna say reviewer there. Um, we're gonna do add review now. It kind of sucked actually that it's listing reviewer as viewer like that, so let's just go tweak something a little bit. Um, instead of returning for a string, just reviewer here, we're going to do self.nickname. Re-render this page. You'll notice now in my list I've actually got the nickname from the reviewer object. So I love 
this presentation. Django looks fun and exciting. Although, who wants to write this one? Anybody? Anybody? John All right. John, John L. J -L, -N L. John L. Same as me. <laughs> Absolutely. And how do we spell your last name, Tom? L E B K O W S K Y. Okay, why? Why? All right. So, yeah, here you notice that it did. It popped up a window there. Okay. Um, I hit save, and it automatically picks John L there. John's going to give us a five. So are the, are the two Jones. windows communicating or something like that? Do you, do you do that? <laughs> yeah, it's okay. all done through. Like they, they automatically it's go automatic. through jQuery. Yep. They somehow communicate. Yep. Okay. Well, it's it's a very for for a tool that basically automatically generates itself with very little code. It's really quite impressive. The caveat that I will throw out there, and the thing that even like any any long term Django user will tell you, um, and, and that they really want to pound home is the admin is not your app, <laughs> right? Like let's just repeat that right now. The admin is not your app, um, but it's free. It is free. Um, it's really meant to be an internal administrative tool, not something that you put out in the world. I mean, it really is built for the use case of we just collaboratively define some data that we're going to want to display in an interesting way on a website. Um, I've built this. I've thrown it up there. You might be the journalist or the content expert that I'm working with. Let's go. Now you can go pound data into this thing, so I have some live data to work with while I'm coding out the rest of my application. It is really the the, the core use case that they're trying to satisfy with that. So, so you mentioned jQuery is tying all these together. Does, does jQuery have a special relationship to Django? It doesn't, officially. They use it internally for the admin tool only, but it does not come in uh, any kind of uh, distribution for your core applications. Um, on the actual client side, on the display side for your real app, they are completely library agnostic when it comes to, to JavaScript. They, the, the Django developers have had a really great relationship with the Dojo guys over the years, and there's been talk of rolling that in. There's talk of making jQuery more official, but they're kind of like, nope, we want you to use it yourself. We want you to bring it in yourself because uh, we can't possibly keep the version that ships with Django up to date to give you like the most recent things that you're going to want to be able to do in the client. So anyway, we got that up and running. Now let's actually uh, get uh, your real website up. So the first thing that we're going to want to do to get the real website up is define a URL pattern. URL patterns are really just regular expressions. And we're going to see how that works real quick. Um, So in order to, the first thing that we might want to display is just a list of all the reviews, right? Um, so we're going to turn this one into, uh, we'll call this just our site index. So what this does is whenever you go to uh, reviews.com slash index, um, we will give you a list of all reviews. So this is going to call reviews.showall. And this name here is basically a, a mapping name that we can use in the template language to generate URLs back to the different views. Um, the other thing we're going to want to be able to display is review in all its glory, right? So uh, let's define one called show. Uh, we'll call that review ID. And basically what we're going to tell it to do using a regular expression here is match um, any digit that we find and that we end with. Great. And for this one we're going to call reviews details. And we'll call this details. Let's call this one show all. All 
All right. So now we're going to go to our views over here. And what we do, so let's do show all first. So show all, like I mentioned in that chart, basically takes a request object that gets passed in by Django. The request object has all your request parameters in it and everything that you're going to need. In this case, we don't even need to be that fancy. All right, so what we are going to do is we're going to take reviews. So in our model, but in order to retrieve objects that are in the database, we call the objects function, and we say, in this case, all. We're going to render a template called index.html, and we're going to pass it a variable called reviews, and that's going to be the reviews that we've collected already. Now, up over here, I'm going to create a directory called templates. And I wouldn't necessarily structure a, a real Django project like this, but I'm doing this mainly to save time. Now, for this, what we might want to do is create a list object, and we'll output the review body in that, which may get a little long, but sure. Sorry, that's a, a fully qualified path to the Python module itself. This is always the uh, the problem with uh, with live coding. I was getting uh, getting a little cocky with. Uh, there we go. But. You can also see how quickly I'm debugging this and, and getting it working thanks to you. Uh, I think it's great. Nope, okay. great. But it just says r.body. Why did I do that? Because I messed up the template. So let's get back to the template. What I really need to do is put it into curly braces to output it. There we go. Yay. <laughs> It might be nice to go and get more uh, more data on these uh, reviews. And so what we'll do is instead of this just being opening text, we're going to make it into a link. One of the, the predefined tags is a URL generator. And what I can do with this is, given the name that I assigned the URL here, show all reviews, or details. We're going to use details because we actually want to link to the details. URL details. And we're going to do r dot primary key. And now let's re-render this. Uh oh, it does not exist. And it's complaining because 
I don't have a review details method yet. So let's write that up real quick. Now in this one, we notice that I wanted to pass it review ID. So in this case, in this case, I'm going to retrieve a single review. I'm going to pass that review into details.html. Got here? Yeah. Oh, yes. Thank you. Oh, and now we actually get links. Well, this is going to break now because I actually don't have my, my template yet. <laughs> so let's go write the template. B and C, I'm going to copy and paste this. Now in this case, I'm just going to include the paragraph, which is our body. Um, and then I'll put some details of the reviewer down here. don't want to expose somebody's real name, so we won't put that in there. Um, and we may want to uh, show the comments, for example. checking out uh, Garrett's comment here. Now, a review of my presentation. I noticed that there's no comments, so let's, uh, let's go back to the admin tool. Um, and we'll actually add a comment. same problem with review and review. I think that's the right one. So we obviously want to change how that gets displayed. But now when I flip back over here, refresh the page, oh, you notice I made a mistake. <laughs> and we'll want to do something like notes and like this. comments in our wonderful new reviews web application. So, I mean, really what we've just done, other than not write forms, is create an end-to-end -end web app uh, that displays information, processes URLs, uh, interacts with the database. Um, am I forgetting anything here uh, that, that I did? Um, and we did it in the span of a half hour, including an interactive session talking about what kind of data that we want to model, which is really you know, the power of the Django framework. Obviously, there's a lot of other things that you can do as well. 
me flip back over my presentation here. So <clears throat> what do we do? We created an application, we tweaked our settings, created a model and sync, sync the DB. We skipped the using the command line to manipulate models. I'm happy to sit around and show you guys how that works and how to do more advanced model manipulation as well. Is that like a console or something? Yep, exactly. You, you basically just use the Python console and you can manipulate the models as if you were just working in Python <coughs> yourself. Um, I actually find myself using that more frequently than I personally use the admin UI. The admin UI ultimately gets pretty slow and clunky and the Django ORM actually has a pretty rich, uh, a pretty rich query language attached to it. Uh, that can generate all sorts of fancy SQL for you, so it's a very easy way to navigate a lot of different models. We added the admin interface, we created a URL mapping, we added a view and a template, and off we went. So what do we do? Uh, next thing you want to do is go to djangoproject.com and actually download Django. And so if you have a Mac, it's basically got everything that you need on it other than Django to start using Django. Um, uh, OS X Leopard has uh, Python 2.6. You have C SQLite built in. Um, so all you have to do is basically go get Django, uh, install it using Easy Install or uh, PIP or anything like that, and you're off to the races, and you can start writing web applications using SQLite. Obviously, if you want to use MySQL, you may have to install the MySQL connector as well, but off you go. Um, there's sort of two good books. There's like the Definitive Jan Guide to Django book that's out there. Uh, don't read it. Um, instead, just read the docs and tutorials that are at djangoproject.com. Being a project developed by journalists, um, the docs are awesome compared to pretty much any other open source project out there. I dare you, I absolutely <coughs> dare you to show me an open source project with better docs than Django. If you find it, I will buy you a beer. <laughs> that's, that's an open invitation. Um, so if you're really that desperate for a beer, create your own open source project and document it. Though, and <laughs> you will get beers from me. Um, uh, the book that you should read if you're getting deep into Django is Pro Django by Marty Elchin. Um, in, uh, f in, in full disclosure, I learned Python to use Django. I had never used the Python programming language before, and I ended up falling in love with Python because of how Django was written, because of how explicit it was and how Pythonic it was. And I really learned what it meant to program in a very Pythonic way from learning Django. And that became even more clear to me when I read Pro Django by Marty Elchin, which really dives deep into a lot of the higher level Python constructs that Django uses to do what it does. Um, it not only gave me a really great uh, appreciation for the inner workings of the framework itself, but it gave me an even bigger appreciation for Python as a programming language. So that is a book that I recommend. There's a bunch of other handy stuff if you're already using, uh, if you're already using Django. Uh, Django Tag It is pretty awesome. It's a tagging framework that's actually better than the tags that come with Django. Uh, it's written by a fellow named Alex Gaynor, who you should also follow on Twitter, um, because not only is he really, really smart with coding stuff, he also posts a lot of really interesting stuff to his blog about the state of education and other interesting things, um, and gets in thoroughly enjoyable flame wars on Twitter as well. Um, <coughs> You should also check out the Django Debug Toolbar. It's a really handy tool that puts a lot of debugging information and a really nice overlay in your web apps. Um, a great tool that isn't necessarily Django related, but I get a ton of use out of, is H the HTML5 Boilerplate Project by Paul Irish. Um, full disclosure again, I'm relatively well acquainted with Paul. He's a He's a great guy, and I think he's doing a really good job. He's an evangelist at Google um, who is really pushing CSS3 and HTML5. Um, he works on the Chrome team there, and it's, it's, it, he's doing great stuff. I love the HTML5 Boilerplate project mainly as a starting point for my templates and side projects. It's really great to, to, to grab. You can like, copy and paste it in there and, 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 and get going very quickly on, on the templating side of your project. There's a Django project called South that I think is really great. Um, it provides full DB migrations. So you notice when I did sync DB and it created my DB tables for me, 
Um, one of the things that I think a lot of people who come to Django from a Rails background re realize quickly is that we don't model in terms of migrations, we model in terms of complete explicit models. And because of that, if you make a modification to the model, it, SyncDB won't actually update your database and do alter columns or tables. They do that to ensure that you don't unnecessarily lose data accidentally. Um, and so for a long time, a lot of people actually wrote their migrations by hand, but Seth is a great project that actually adds automatic migrations to Django as well. Um, so a lot of, you can get your own mileage out of it, but it works great. More handy stuff, uh, Celery. Uh, if you're doing any kind of big data process, uh, processing and you need an data process distributed task queue, Celery is your go-to project there in the Python world. It's awesome. Oh, ignore John's uh, query, Solar Query Builder. I still need to be open source that. <laughs> um, it's something that we use a, very, a lot internally uh, at BV. Um, and I, one of my one of the more exciting things that's actually going into uh, Django 1.3 are class-based views, um, and you can read all about those. And that's instead of just using a Python function for a view, uh, they're going to start allowing you to use Python classes, so you can remove even more of the boilerplate out of those view functions and prevent those views from becoming spaghetti code, which they uh, have a tendency to do. Um, so anyway. That gets me to the end of my presentation. I actually did that in 57 minutes, apparently. Um, wow, I am gonna get this. But, uh, <laughs> it's time to come up with a new presentation. Um, thanks a lot, guys. I really appreciate it. Uh, let's uh, do 10 minutes for group questions, sure. and then we can. I'm happy to stay and mill about and answer more questions. Um, and I am gonna have another beer afterwards because uh, I think I'm gonna. Would you like one? And I like beer. One? So, anybody who would fetch me a beer, I would be forever <laughs> grateful. He's drinking Shire Bach until my left. Beggars can't be choosers, Christian. So, Shire Bach it is. <laughs> it's cold beer. Thank you. All right. Again, thank you guys. Um, anyway, questions? Yes, Andrew, you had some questions. Yes. Um, so, I write rich clients' iPhone. Yeah, probably. Right. And uh, I need to run in parallel to web frameworks, right? Because mm -hmm. web is there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I normally come in via, via REST calls, right? And don't have views, but they have routes and, and all that sort of stuff. Uh -huh. Do I go through, uh, do I go talk to the Django people or do, do I go get pylons? What do I go do to run in parallel with the web framework or with Django? A couple good options here. Um, one, I mean, you can write RESTful services on Django pretty easily. Like the URL mapper makes that extraordinarily easy to do. So if you wanted to go through the effort of uh, creating your own URL mappings that are RESTful, and instead of returning HTML, um, you can write templates that return JSON, for example, or XML that can be processed by your uh, by your rich clients. Now, part of the cool thing about the class-based views that are coming in is that you can actually separate uh, your handlers based on the kind of request that's incoming. So you, in your class, you have a, if it's a get, do this. If it's a get plus Ajax, do this. If it's a post, do this. So you can really create very clean, restful interfaces in those views. Um, if you want to go totally quick and dirty, um, there is a, uh, a Django project out there, I don't know the state of its maintenance, called uh, Django Piston. Yes. I'm right on that, right, Brad? Yes. Have you seen it? Yeah. So what Piston does is basically can inspect your models and auto-create RESTful views against your models. So it, totally cool. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, which, again, is quick and dirty because don't necessarily always want to expose your entire DB structure. Well, I, yeah. I know how to cut. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so I don't know. Yeah, I don't know if you'd want to create a public API off of Piston, but if you need a kind of a quick and dirty RESTful interface to your models, uh, Piston does a does a good job there. Thank you. Uh, anybody with more experience with Piston than, than I have? have Piston's any? sort of the de facto one right now. It was written by the guys that uh, uh, do Bitbucket. 
Uh, it's what they use for their API. Cool. Uh, there's another one by uh, Daniel Lindsley, uh, who's a guy that wrote Haystack, which is a, a search uh, plugin for Django uh, called TastyPod. That's sort of a, an in-development one, uh, but there's a lot of people uh, starting to migrate that direction. So he's the writer on. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I was like 100 lines. We just have around in house. Cool. Any other questions, guys? No question. Yeah. You might want to talk for a few minutes about you know an organization like a newspaper would like to build this competency. They want to start doing some online interactives. What is sort of the minimum of what they need to have? Is it just like hire somebody and you're good, or? You know, what, and how long, you know, what do they need to do to like build this up? Because a lot of them would like to do it and they don't really know where to start. Yeah, um, I mean, I think any, I mean, this might be overreaching, but I think any competent software developer should be able to pick up Python and Django. If they, if they decided that Django is the way they wanted to go, to be able to develop kind of interactive applications as an adjunct to whatever content management system they're already using. Um, you know, any competent developer should be able to get going and do like basic widgets in Django in the span of a week. Um, so if you have a developer, great. Point them at the project, um, have them go to town. What could be tricky for an existing organization that isn't already built on Django, um, and I'm sure Christian can actually talk to this, is that if you want to use Django and you have an existing CMS, you have to figure out how to get the views and the the code that you write in Django and get those little interactive widgets actually into the site itself. I mean, worst case scenario, you can iframe them in, right? Um, there are lots of different ways that you can expose code written on different stacks into existing sites. Um, best case scenario, you're already on, you're already a, a, a Django-based site, and you you start interacting with the, the the subject matter experts and the journalists or whomever directly. Um, and, and hopefully you have a functional enough organization that allows for that kind of interaction, right? And I'm not saying that we have those functional organizations out there, especially when you start getting into bigger organizations. Um, it's awesome that we have places like the, the Trib here or uh, you know, Lawrence Journal World that give, their, they're small enough to give their coders a lot of freedom and leeway into selecting the tools that they want to use. Um, I don't, do you want to talk to that at all, Christian, about how you've worked I mean, in at the Statesman? We had, at the Statesman, we were, had a development group that was basing a lot of their future work in Django, and then that was, that was moved to Atlanta. And they are building a new CMS in Django, but currently we're on a different system. And so we bring in, we, we have some tools that are Django-based, and then we have, like you're talking about, pieces of content that we'll use Akamai's Edge side includes to bring into our site, and that's <coughs> the main way we do it, or iframes. Right. But um, the, the we use a lot of ES Edge side includes. Yeah, uh, Akamai Edge side includes are a good function, I mean, it's, it's a nice function of Akamai to have available to you if you, if you have it, so. Um, that's probably another topic, is just the CDN. <laughs> hey, go ahead. So this is all pretty new to me. Um, yeah. It looks like it's fairly easy to install on your Mac and get it running. I was wondering uh, for like my web host, I mean Bluehost or something like that, can you just install Python out there or how does that work or how do you Hosting, yeah, it? great great question actually. Um, there are a fair number of, of Django friendly hosts out there. Um, I couldn't comment on Bluehost, I'm not familiar with them. Um, However, Media Temple actually now offers Django containers where you can deploy Django apps into. Uh, what's that, sir? Right, so that's cool. Oh. Yep. Yeah. So, uh, fully supporting Media Temple. Uh, there's a great uh, UK based all other data centers in Dallas web hosts that I love um, that are super cheap um, and provide lots of different tools called Web Faction, where if you're looking to get up and running with a bunch of different uh, applications, uh, uh, they have really easy to use installers for pylons, Django, Rails, you name it, they pretty much support it. Um, and they have like hosting starting at I think like nine bucks a month. 
Yeah. Um, was again factions. Web faction. Web faction. You can host Django applications on something like Dreamhost. Uh, you go on yep. Dreamhost Wiki and there's there's instructions on how to do it. It's not as fast, but it's possible to do. Yeah, and, and even in like you just know, about any any virtual hosting where you can get in running on it. Uh, yeah. No matter how much support you get once you've got it going. Yeah, and then that, that really is it. Like, if, if you want to use Django, I would recommend finding somebody who, and if you're really new to this sort of thing, finding somebody who gives you like an easy installer or something like that to, to work off of. Um, but yeah, yeah, lots of different ones out there. Um, there used to be a, a website, I think, djangohosting.com or something. I don't know if it's even, like, I haven't looked at it for ages now. Uh, mainly because anything professional that I do, I, I host in Amazon EC2. Um, so, uh, smaller hosting is, is, is uh, I, I'm not as up to date as I could be on, on who supports what at this point. The right? author of Bog Whiskey just posted today um, an awesome New York web hosting, and he has a list of seven, uh, I don't know what you call them, equivalents to Heroku for, mm -hmm. for Django Python. Uh, so this is the, you just push code up and they host it for you, kind of thing? I know, I'm, I'm still there, waiting for my, I'm still so. waiting for my Jengi. Right, so Jengi's one, and there's, oh, one. there's oh, apparently six others, which is news to me. The one that's actually the most interesting is Elderon. Um, the guys that do Pinex, uh, which is a, yeah. a toolkit built on top of Django, have announced that they're going to be releasing their internal platform. Uh, here over the next few months. It's now Gondor.io. Gondor, yeah. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> they love one of the rings apparently. <laughs> yeah, like, that one will be the one to watch, I think, of all of them. So I, in my rounds, looking at the Rails people, people, I went to the Python user group. They seem mostly sysadmin people. Is there a Django group in town? That's a great question. We are uh, actively trying to start one, actually. One of the guys on my team, a fellow named Ben Weatherman, um, is, there's a there's a Django meetup group for Austin right now, just on meetup.com or .org or whatever it is. Um, and uh, we are actively trying to get that together. Um, one of the a, one of the more major Django shops here in town has already volunteered office space. We just have to have to kind of get that one together, but you're right. Like the Python users group here in town is definitely a lot more uh, either academically or uh, kind of sysadmin focused, I'd say, uh, than into kind of web web. Well, they were very stuff. smart people. Oh yeah, absolutely. But uh, they weren't what I was looking for. Couple couple of great things to note: um, the University of Texas is uh, switching all of their web properties slowly but surely over to Django based properties. So um, if you do ever have to hire Django folks, uh, the university is a good place to start looking. Um, One of the core contributors to Django works at the university. Yep, Gary Wilson. So, uh, which is a, a, a pretty wonderful thing to have here in Austin is, is that yeah, one of the core contributors uh, lives here and works at the university. And Gary is a great guy and always uh, happy to answer questions and stuff too. So, uh, we actually had a Django sprint. Uh, for the next release of Django, uh, just this past weekend at Bizarre Works offices. Um, so we'll definitely be supporting that community as well because we have a number of pretty major deployments from built out of my group on Django that are out there live in the world. So uh, we've we've gotten a lot out of that community and we absolutely aim to give back to it at Bizarre Works. Cool. Yeah, slightly off topic. But yeah, totally. You say you're, uh, you, you've said a few times that your background is an engineering background. Yep. Uh, what exactly? I'm just curious. Is that background? Uh, uh, I have a degree in computer science and mathematics uh, from the University of Waterloo. Um, I spent seven years in engineering, HCI, and product management at Trilogy Software here in town. Um, and then I did two years as the CTO at Thinktive, which is a digital agency here, and I've spent the last two years at Bizarre Voice. Uh, the reason I ask is I'm, I'm researching the, uh, the software engineering night master's program at, uh, at UT. Oh, okay, um, cool. So, I mean, 
Yeah, that's kind of why I'm here. I'm trying to kind of figure out which direction I want to go. So, yeah. yeah I've, I've, I've walked a lot of different paths in my career. Yeah. But, um, I, I always come back to writing code, mm -hmm. uh, which is definitely one of the core things that I, I love to do. Um, I actually have a friend that did the software engineering masters at UT, so I can I can uh, introduce you guys if, if, if you want. That, that would be great. Yeah, I feel like I'm just trying to figure out. There's a whole lot of a whole lot of options, and I'm not really sure exactly which, what direction they're going. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Let's let's talk after. Cool. Anything else? You inspired me to make an announcement, um, which I, I was too shy to do at the beginning of the meeting. But um, <laughs> hi, I'm Janet, and I work for Mozilla uh, on the. Mozilla Developer Network site, which among other things has a lot of documentation about open web standards. And we're doing a documentation sprint this weekend, Friday and Saturday. So if you either you know, know some stuff about web standards or um, want to get some experience about writing, you know, with writing documentation, come talk to me and I'll, I'll fill you in on the details of all of that. Okay. Okay. Well, thank you very much, John. That was a great presentation. It definitely shows how quickly you can get something up and running with these web frameworks. I mean, you, can, you know, just a little bit of knowledge and some working with it, and then you can develop something very quick, like rapid application development, which is what we want. Um, while I was listening to the presentation, I got a message that I wanted to tell you all about. Coming up on February 25th is Austin Startup Weekend. And it's an event for entrepreneurs where you can make a pitch for 60 seconds and they'll be judging and things like that. And so I'll make sure that the meetup group has um, that announcement and I'll put it on Twitter and make sure that you guys get all the information about that. It's a lot of fun and they definitely always need more coders at that thing. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's not idea people. Yeah, I, I, I did the last one and it was it was it was a lot of fun. Um, and, and they can always they, they can always use more designers and more developers. So good. Yeah. The back end of your of your presentation had a lot of information. Is there a way to get that to send you to get it to us? Yeah, I mean, yeah. Uh, absolutely. Um, I will even just I'll PDF up this presentation. And yeah, I, I, I can, yeah, you can do that. I can embed that on the site along with the video. I shot video of the whole thing and shot pictures of you guys. So, yeah. Okay, great. Well, thanks again for coming. If there's pizza or drinks left, feel free to mill around a little bit and continue talking. Ask John some questions. Sorry. And I'll see you next month at the meeting. Thanks for coming. Thank you.